107. We will have two sessions. We will have two sessions and they will be separated by a break for the students to get refreshments. The first session will be with Dr. Roberts and Medicine and the second session with Professor Sheldon. Uh, so enjoy the day. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. Please don't be shy. I've explained to our guests that you're not shy. Okay? Well, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll wish you good morning because um, certainly on my time it's still the morning. <laughs> so um, we were told that it would be good if we told you a little something about our personal careers. But I was also told that you had instructions, you had to read the Nobel autobiographies and various other um, stuff that's been written about me. And so I'm going to try and avoid, if at all possible, um, repeating stuff that you might have already read. But inevitably there will be a, a little crossover here and there. So I grew up in England, I grew up in Bath which is one of those very beautiful towns. If you've never been there and you go to England, Bath is some place you should put on your list of places to go and visit. It really is beautiful. I didn't realize it at the time. The problem is whenever you grow up in a city, you never realize how nice it is until you leave, and, and then all of a sudden you see it in its true light. I got interested in science in Bath because my father bought me a chemistry set learned how to make explosives, I loved explosives, I loved fireworks, and that set me on a course to do chemistry. I did chemistry at university, and during the course of my time at university, I read a book um, called The Thread of Life by a man called John Kendrew, which was all about the beginnings of molecular biology. And again, this is something I would recommend to all of you, is you should read about stuff that is outside of the normal flow of events, the normal things that you do. So if you're doing chemistry, read about other stuff. If you're doing physics, read about other stuff. Because you never know when you're going to run into something that sounds so interesting and so fascinating, and you say, gosh, that's what I would like to do. And this book of uh, John Kendrew was about the origins of molecular biology. By the time I finished, I knew I wanted to be a molecular biologist. And that's what I've become. That's what I did. Now, it turned out it was quite difficult to switch from chemistry to molecular biology. I applied to um, eight places in order to do molecular biology when I got my PhD in chemistry. Everybody turned me down except for one man, a man called Jack Strominger, who at the time was at the University of Wisconsin. And he was working on bacterial cell walls, this sort of very complicated structure that surrounds a bacterium. That bacterium, um, it, it turns out, is very sensitive, or at the time was very sensitive, I should say, to an antibiotic called penicillin. And so Dr. Strominger determined that he wanted to work out what it was that made Staph aureus susceptible to penicillin. And it turned out that the key step was the very last step of bacterial cell wall biosynthesis of which there are like 50 steps along the way, and he had to work out the entire pathway before he got to the step that was responsible for penicillin sensitivity. Now, of course, these days, most Staph aureus are resistant to penicillin. They picked up pieces of DNA that make them resistant, and so penicillin is not such a great drug anymore, uh, mainly because it's been overused. But even so, for localized infections and so on, it's still OK. Now, just before I was due to go to um, Wisconsin to work with Strominger, he wrote me a letter and he said, I've just been appointed to Harvard. I've just got a professorship at Harvard. Please delay your arrival for two months and come to Harvard instead. So quite by chance, I got to Harvard. And this is something else that I think is really important that this was one of the really lucky breaks in my life. I, I've had the most enormous amount of luck in my life, but this was a good one. I would have gone to Wisconsin, maybe I would have done something good, maybe not, I don't know. But going to Harvard was a, just key in my life, made it really a very good life. 
went to Harvard. Um, I started working on something that was a pickup project from something that another postdoc was doing. And he was doing it by a way that I thought was not necessarily the best way to do it. And so I looked around in the literature, saw that there was a much better way, I thought, to do it, and pursued that as soon as this postdoc left. He was in Australia, and he left, went back to Australia, and so I was more or less left on my own. And I, again, was lucky. Strominger wasn't that interested in what I was doing. It was kind of the finish up to a project. And he had, in the meantime, decided to change his field completely, and so he was off doing all sorts of other stuff. So I more or less by myself got going on this project, went over to the lab of a man called Fred Sanger. Uh, Fred is probably one of the, the, or was one of the very best uh, biochemists that I ever knew. He won, ended up winning two Nobel Prizes. He could easily have won a third. He developed all the methods for sequencing proteins, and then RNA, and then DNA. And so I learned how to do that, came back to Harvard, started doing it, and everybody came to me to learn how to do it because I, again, by chance, ended up being the first person in the Boston area who knew how to do these methods. And so that was very exciting. I met all sorts of people that I would never otherwise have met. And two things happened during that time. One is that Jim Watson, the man who, with Francis Crick, discovered the structure of DNA, the double helical structure of DNA, um, he I was told, was looking for someone with my skills to go and work at Cold Spring Harbor. And so a, a good friend of mine, Mark Potashny, um, said, oh, Jim is going to come and talk to you about a job at Cold Spring Harbor. And I was ready for a job at the time, and so I wait and I wait. Absolutely nothing happens. I ne never heard anything. And then Mark comes up to me one day and he says, well, Jim doesn't actually know who you are. Uh, perhaps you can go and introduce yourself, which I did. Ten minutes later, I had a job at Cold Spring Harbor. Now, that was all very well and good, but what he wanted me to do at Cold Spring Harbor uh, was a project that when I got there, I thought was crazy, because there were already two other groups already doing it. But again, by luck, I had gone over to Harvard Medical School and listened to a lecture by a man called Dan Nathans, who later ended up being a Nobel Prize winner also. And he talked about something called a restriction enzyme. And he um, had been working with this enzyme that had been discovered by his colleague, Ham Smith, which was the first example of an enzyme that would take DNA and cut it very specifically into pieces. And it occurred to me that this could be incredibly useful to develop methods for sequencing DNA. And so when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, and instead of doing this project that Jim Watson had hired me to do, I said, no, I'm, I'm going to start working on restriction enzymes and see if there are more of these enzymes like the one that Ham Smith had found. And it turned out they were everywhere. And so in a relatively short period of time, I had discovered 30 of these things. Now, you have to remember, DNA is huge. A, a single molecule of DNA is absolutely enormous. Even some of the shortest ones are more than a million base pairs long, a million of these individual subunits that we call nucleotides or bases. And it was just very difficult to determine the sequence of something so big, you needed a way to break it down into small pieces so you could do it. And it turned out that these enzymes allowed you to do just that. They could break the DNA down into small pieces. And as a result of working with these things and everybody expressing interest in them, I realized that you could actually make money by making these enzymes and selling them to the research community because everybody wanted them. We, had, we were just giving them away to, from Cold Spring Harbor to anybody who wanted them. So I go and talk to Jim Watson and I say, hey, why don't we start a company at Cold Spring Harbor and we will make these enzymes, sell them to the research community, and then use the profits to support the research at Cold Spring Harbor. To which Jim Watson, um, first of all, he was mad at me because I'd not pursued the project that he wanted me to pursue. And then he said, oh, it's really dirty to be involved in industry. You know, true academics don't get involved in industry. You should avoid that. And he, he wasn't interested at all. And then he said, of course, you can't make money doing that sort of thing. So anyway, so to cut a long story short, 
I discovered there was a gentleman called Don Cole, who was based up in Boston, who had had the same idea. He was a man, he'd been a professor at Harvard, or an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. He didn't get tenure, and he got, he got fed up with the system. He said, this is not the way to treat academics. Um, and he said, I'm going to start a company and use the profits to support research, and in this way become both an academic institution and a funding agency, all within the context of this company. And so when I talked to him, there was he, his wife, and one technician, and this was the company. Um, they offered me a partnership in it, which I didn't want, because I was sort of in an academic institution, and I said, well, I'll just be your chief consultant. And so that's how New England Biolabs, the company I now work with, got started. And there were four people in a basement in Beverly. Um, at the time, they were making just enough money to keep going. Um, now we're a company of 550 people. We did about $180 million worth of business last year. And about 20% um, of the company are just doing research. Much of it is really very basic. It turned out that these enzymes, these restriction enzymes that I discovered were the basis of the biotechnology industry. I'm sure you've all heard about biotechnology and what one can do by cloning genes and so on. And the fact that these enzymes were being made commercially meant that anybody could get involved in this. Prior to that, you sort of had to make the enzymes yourself, and so a lot of labs wouldn't do that. They try and beg and borrow them, but now you could buy them commercially. And so, in a way, this was really the birth of the biotechnology industry. These reagents allowed the biotechnologists to get going. Um, in addition to restriction enzymes, we made other enzymes that were necessary for this. And so that got biotechnology going. Now, something else interesting happened at this time. This was all in the 1970s. In the early 1980s, uh, I got to know very well a man called Mark Van Montague. Mark Van Montague is the father of genetic engineering of plants. He used to come to my lab regularly because he wanted to know what were the new restriction enzymes that we had found so that he could get the strains, take them back to Belgium, and then grow them in Belgium and, and use for the uh, people there who were doing recombinant work. He was interested in a phenomenon that was taking place in plants are called crown galls. So it turns out there are bacteria that infect plants, and in the process, they cause these huge galls, very large lumps. They're sort of like tumors, if you like, of plants to grow. And he wanted to know how this was happening. He discovered that these bacteria were transferring DNA from themselves into the plant cells and in the process were changing the way in which the plant cells behaved so that they formed these big galls or tumors on the plants. And it occurred to him that this was a way that one could introduce new DNA into plants, not just the ones the bacteria wanted to put in, but ones that perhaps we wanted to put in. And this was the origin of so-called GMOs, the genetically modified organisms, that people are so upset about. In fact, here in Thailand, the government has banned GMOs. Very, very foolish decision. Um, this is really something that is terrible. It turns out that the methods for making these genetically modified organisms are really just a much more precise way of doing what the traditional plant breeders had been doing for years. The way plant breeding goes is that if you want to introduce a new trait into a plant, let us say you want it to grow taller, or you want it to be very stiff when it grows, or you want to have more grains at the end of the rice stalk, the way in which you do it is you find natural traits of rice that automatically do this, cross it with the ones that you know how to grow well, and in this way, you look for those rare variants, the rare mutants, that have picked up this additional trait. Thanks to this method that Mark Van Montague came up with, you can now do this much more precisely. You can find the genes that are responsible for making the plant grow straight or for producing the large amounts of yield. 
and you can put those genes directly into the strains that the growers are normally growing. And as a result of this, you can do it in a much, much more precise way than the plant breeders could ever do it. You can do it much faster than the plant breeders could ever do it. And in this way, you can have dramatic effects on crops. Now, something that's very interesting and relevant to Thailand is papayas. You all love papayas here in Thailand, but there is a nasty disease of papayas called a ring spot virus that is transmitted by an insect that comes along and grows on the papaya plants. The virus gets into the plants and it kills them. This was happening about 30 years ago in Hawaii, where papaya is a very important crop. And so the scientists at the University of Hawaii decided that they would try to make a variety of papaya that was resistant to this virus. And they did it using GMO, genetic modification, of the sort that Mark Van Montague had discovered. Well, they were very successful. Within two or three years, they had plants that were resistant to the ring spot virus. And now, something like 80% of all of the papayas that are growing in Hawaii are resistant to ring spot virus. They grow well, they have a good commercial product. In Thailand, you have exactly the same disease, but because of the GMO ban by the government, the papaya farmers are not allowed to grow this particular variety of papayas, and they're losing their livelihood. This is just one example of a way in which GMOs can be incredibly helpful. There are many, many, many examples of all of this. And in fact, there is a website um, that I've put together about this called supportprecisionagriculture.org that explains what is going on. And I've been so concerned about all of this for a long time now that I've organized a campaign by the Nobel laureates and Shelley Glashow is one of the co-signatories. We have 123 Nobel laureates who've all signed on to say they support GMOs because everything says they're safe. We've been doing this for 30 years now. There is not a single example, not one example, of a problem that has arisen because of this. And unfortunately, what has happened is that the anti-GMO people, people like Greenpeace, who claim to be protecting the environment, um, they have found it very profitable for their organization to be against GMOs. They've got loads of money coming in to help fight GMOs. And it really is a non-issue. The science is absolutely solid. There is no danger whatsoever um, from this method. It is not inherently dangerous. And so, but they love the money. They like the fact they have 500 million euros a year coming in in order to support this movement. Um, and it doesn't matter in Europe and in the developed world, it really isn't a problem. But in the developing countries, particularly in India, in South America, in certain parts of Southern Asia, there, there is just a major problem uh, that will only ever get solved as a result of using GM techniques. And so what we're trying to do is to persuade Greenpeace to just stop being against GMOs and to let things go on. And so what's happened is that my early involvement with restriction enzymes, with the uses of these uh, for general use, has now led to my trying to support um, the GMO method, trying to get out the truth about the science here. Um, and it's sort of the, the natural progression of biotechnology. It's really interesting. I talk about this quite regularly. And very often there are people who are diabetics in, in the audience. And so I ask them, you know, you're diabetic, where do you think your insulin comes from? Because these days almost everybody who is diabetic takes doses of insulin, human insulin. And this is insulin that's either made in bacteria or it's made in yeast by recombinant methods, by exactly this GM method that Greenpeace and Co are against when you try to do it in plants. And here, you've got a recombinant product that is keeping people alive. No one seems to object to that. They seem to think this is actually quite a good thing to be kept alive. Uh, I do too. Uh, but if we could do this for food, 
And that also is a good thing, you know, if you live in the depth of Africa, um, you can't afford medicine, um, but food is what you really need. Food is medicine for an awful lot of people around the world. And to try to deprive people of this, just so some European organization can be making money and living probably quite a luxurious lifestyle, I find appalling. This is just not the way that one should be conducting business. So I'm, I'm trying to get Greenpeace and the other Greens to accept the truth of the science here. Um, I hope you will come, look at the website, supportprecisionagriculture.org. There's a lot of information there about why GMOs are good, and maybe you can have some influence locally, and eventually, hopefully, the Thai government can be convinced that they need to change their mind too, that GMOs are safe, this is something they should be supporting, they should be uh, taking full advantage of, because it will lead to, to help for everybody. So, what I've tried to do is just to give you a little idea of something that was not in my biography, of stuff that has gone on in my life, and to point out that no matter what it is you do, um, I, I don't care what you're doing, um, think about things other than just what you're doing locally, what is your main business, think more globally about what you can do to help the world, uh, because everybody has this opportunity to help the world whenever they can. And the other lesson that I always like to give is that luck plays an immense part in everybody's life. Every single one of you in this room has luck from time to time. And the secret is when you get a lucky break, don't feel guilty about it. It's like the guy who's playing tennis and the ball just hits the net, drops over to the other side. Don't feel guilty because you won the point and because the guy at the other side probably wouldn't feel guilty if the same thing happened to you. And instead of worrying about it, make the most of it. And work twice as hard on the next shot to make sure you win that one too. And so when luck comes your way, take full advantage of it. And so I think with that, I'll stop. I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have on any subject. If I can't answer it, I will tell you. If it's something that Shelley can answer better than I can, then um, he can come along and answer it in the next session. Okay, thank you.